You are listening to episode number 59 of the Secondary Science Simplified podcast. If you've been listening to the episodes we've put out so far this year, you know that we've been talking about really rethinking where you are this year and what you want your goals to be. We've talked about living and working within your current season of life and how and why you need to be scheduling rest. But I know that some of you listening are still just struggling with major burnout. You may feel burned out and overwhelmed, burned out and bored, or just burned out and blah. And that's why I knew I wanted to bring in Amber Harper for today's episode. Amber is a longtime educator, author, speaker, and podcaster. She's the founder of The Burned In Teacher and author of the book, Hacking Teacher Burnout, which gives struggling teachers a path to follow as they navigate their way out of burnout. She is a teacher burnout coach working with educators to help them grow through their burnout and take their next best steps towards what they want from their career in education and in life. In this episode, Amber shares her burnout story with me and what led her to leave the classroom and come back two different times. She shares what it means to be a burned-in teacher and how to begin taking action to change yourself, even if and especially when you cannot change your environment or circumstances. This interview challenged me and it really encouraged me, and I hope it'll do the same for you. So without further ado, let's dive into my interview with Amber Harper, the burned-in teacher. This is Secondary Science Simplified, a podcast for secondary science teachers who want to engage their students and simplify their lives. I'm Rebecca Joyner from It's Not Rocket Science. As a high school science teacher turned curriculum writer, I'm passionate about helping other science teachers love their jobs, serve their students, and do it all in only 40 hours a week. Are you ready to rock the time you spend in your classroom and actually have a life outside of it? You're in the right place, teacher friend. Let's get to today's episode. Hi, Amber. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Thank you for asking. I'm so happy to be here. I am so thrilled you're here and we made it through my technical difficulties. And now we get to have this conversation that I am just confident is going to really serve my listeners. So for my listeners who maybe don't know who you are as the burned in teacher, why don't you just kind of give them a little context, a little background of your career history, your teaching experience, and kind of what you're doing now. Sure. Thank you so much for asking. Yeah. So I've been teaching now 14 years. I've taught, I actually started my teaching career in fifth grade for about five and a half months and then moved to first grade. Then I've been second, third, and back to first. And now I'm in kindergarten. This is my second year teaching kindergarten. I've worked in three different districts and worked under many different administrators and I am married to my high school sweetheart, who is uh, an elementary school principal in the same district that I'm in, um, which is really nice. Any teachers out there who are married to, you know, who are partners with someone who is working in the same district, like, you know how nice that is. And I'm just so grateful for that. And we have, uh, together, we have two daughters. Um, Our oldest is a uh, college junior at Indiana University in Bloomington. And our youngest is is 14. She's a freshman. And we just can't believe how old they are. And they actually both, we both used to teach in the same school that the girls went to. So we just had, we've just had such a great experience as educators together. You were going to say something. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, first I'm going to say, I don't know how you have daughters that old. So you need to like (laughs) email me your skincare regimen after this. (laughs) And then the second thing I was going to say is, okay, so if your youngest is 14 and you taught for 14 years, when did like did you take start and take a break? Did you just start when she was in like kind of tell me yeah. how you space that? Cause I know so great many question. Teachers are always like, What do I do when I have little kids? <laughs> so my husband and I, we actually had our first daughter. I was right out of high school whenever we had her. So we were teenage parents. Uh, we went to college as parents. So Amazing. we just yeah. So we We've worked really hard um, <laughs> to make it to where we are today, you know, and as educators, and we know what it's like to really put your nose to the grindstone and get stuff done. And and so we're really grateful for it. And, and she's a great kid. So I actually did uh, get pregnant with our second daughter my first year as a teacher. Okay. Found out I was pregnant in September of 2007. 
and then had her in April of 2008. So I had my my very first classroom. I was pregnant most of that year and it was awful. (laughs) Yeah. You're like, first year teaching's hard. Also being pregnant, very hard. Also pregnant. Yeah. And part of my burnout story is that I worked for a team that was not inclusive and it was just a really awful first couple of years. Okay, having my own classroom. I'm going to ask you about that. But first, before anyone like turns off the podcast and they're like, Rebecca, why are you interviewing an elementary school teacher? She's mentioned nothing about high school or science or anything. I want my listeners to know why I really wanted to talk to you. And that is because we have kind of been talking about this month on the podcast when this is going to air, just kind of rethinking the new year and rethinking like the kinds of goals we're setting And doing goal setting in a way that prioritizes rest and then also really takes into consideration the season of life that we're in. And so with that, I was like, you know, kind of to wrap up this series before we move on to some other stuff, I was like, I want to bring you in because I know you because I heard you on my other friend's podcast talking because you're the burned in teacher. And so I really wanted to hear from you and just kind of what your burnout story is that you referenced and kind of how you started all of this. And just how that could serve my listeners. Because I know a lot of people, this time of year is hard. It's cold. It's dark. And it's too soon to put the countdown on the whiteboard for the end of the year. So we're like, Absolutely. how are we going to make it? Yeah. So if you could like tell us your story, I would just, I'm so excited to hear it and for my listeners to hear Yeah, absolutely. So I think no matter what grade level you teach, whether you teach littles like I do, or you teach adults in college, or you know everything in between, I think we can all relate to the fact that this this career is so incredibly challenging. And my story is no different than many others, although my path for what I took to get from where I was to where I am now, as far as alleviating my burnout and grow what I call growing through it, can be very different because burnout is very deeply personal. But like I said, I think we can all agree that it's um, it's real and it's it's more than a buzzword, like it's backed by science and there are so many reasons for us to burn out as educators. So I will try to keep my story short, although it it really does start in 2007 and really I rode that roller coaster of burnout all the way through, especially 2014, where I had a really infamous emotional mental breakdown in front of my teacher friends. And there were nine of us on this team. And when I speak about my story and teach about this burned in process that I've created, I typically start with, I'm here today to talk to you about how how I broke down and uh, all because of dog shit. And <laughs> and really, as we all know, like those those small things that happen in our lives can become so big when we've been struggling for so long in silence and in silos. And so it really started, like I said, that first year when I was when I was teaching with this team, there was really no space for me to share my ideas or ask questions or especially my favorite question, which is why. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I always want to know, which I probably should have been a science teacher because I always want to know why <laughs> things work the way they do. And I anyway, so I asked tons of questions and they didn't like that. And without getting into too much depth, we just did not click. And it really destroyed my spirit. I was one of those brand new go-getter teachers, you know, that um, really just wanted to go in and and just discover what it was like to have my own classroom. And they really did crush my spirit. Luckily, I was moved to a different grade level the next year. And that's when I realized the, actually two years later, and I realized the power of leaving a grade level and just moving down the hallway with mm-hmm. different people and how that can make such a big difference in your in your teaching journey and your outlook. So without going into too much detail, I basically had so many ups and downs. So anybody out there who feels like you've ridden the roller coaster of burnout and you feel like there's no way out, I just want you to know that you're not alone. And there are a lot of teachers out there that feel like you do. And what I don't want teachers to do is to continue to tell themselves that this is just the way that this is. This is just the way this teacher life has to be and that this is what I have to settle for. Because that's what I told myself for 11 years of my teaching career was that this is just the way it is. This sucks. Something's wrong with me. I'm broken. Why can't I just be? Like I said, I taught in the same school as my husband, our daughter, and we lived three minutes away. Like we had so many things to be grateful for. And I was feeling, I was so incredibly miserable. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to 2014, I had been doing a lot of Googling, like, what are the signs and symptoms of burnout? How should I know if I should get a different job? And then I would have that cognitive dissonance where it's like, what do you mean you need it? You want a different job? You're a teacher. You'll always be a teacher. Like, no one's going to hire somebody who's been a teacher for 10 years. Like, 
what's wrong with you? You're you you have nothing to offer. And so I was having all of these terrible conversations in my head. And then, like I said, um, it was either the end of September or the beginning of October in 2014. We had just gotten a brand new puppy in July. And I went home to let him out. Like I said, we lived about three minutes away from the school. He had crapped all over in his kennel. He had rolled in it, laid in it. Like it was just one of those situations where it just, it literally was like the straw that broke the camel's back. Like I had a complete and total meltdown. I could not stop crying. I was shaking. I probably shouldn't have been driving. I was, I could barely even, I just could not contain my emotion. And I was in such a state that when I walked back through the doors, all of my teacher teaching team was standing there talking before we went to get our kids from recess. And then when I walked in and they all knew my husband, Jeff, because we had worked together for years in the same building, they thought he had died. Like that is... So can you imagine, like you're laughing, right? Like it's so silly. Like I tell this story and I, yeah, I used to feel so silly about it, but it really, it really humanizes the amount of stress and overwhelm and depersonalization and all the things that just build and build and build under the surface. And I still almost get emotional talking about it today because I was in such a dark, dark place. And so imagine their underwhelm when I tell them that Oliver had crapped in his kennel I remember the look on one of my friend's faces. Jane looked at me like, you got to be kidding me. And that's she had an expletive in there too. She was like, you got to (laughs) be kidding me. Like, you're that. And I just could not. I had to have someone take over my class for the rest of the day. Well, and I laugh because I've been there. Like, huh? the other day, my husband came home and I was literally screaming into a plate. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Like, silent, kind of loud shouting into a plate. And he was like, what happened to get you this place? And I didn't even want to tell him because it did. Like you said, it seems so small. But when you're functioning over capacity for such a long time, and for you, that was seven years. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, I'm honestly surprised it didn't happen sooner. Well, the the fact is it did. But I did it in a much more private setting. Mm -hmm. I did it at home, you know. And I remember another specific time where, and this would have been uh, February of 20. 16 that I was still, I had moved. I I actually quit that job. I actually left in the middle of the school year and took an executive director position at a local educational nonprofit. I loved teaching. I loved kids. It wasn't that I hated teaching. It was that I hated where I was in my life as a teacher. And I felt like just leaving was the solution. And for and for some teachers, it is. It, it really is the best decision for them. And I never want anybody to believe that burned-in teacher means that I'm like putting on, you know, rose-colored glasses and I'm toxically positive and I smile and laugh through all of my pain. That's not at all what this is. But for me, my next best step was seeing what my potential was outside of the classroom. And in this specific situation, I really did make a very rash decision and I wasn't, I didn't know the situation of this nonprofit. And I was there just long enough to close it down. They shouldn't have hired me. Like it was just, (laughs) it added insult to injury because I was like, wow, this is going to be so great. Like I get to be a leader. I get to work in education. I get to work with other teachers from all over the county. And um, no, I was, it was just a situation that was just very, very disappointing. So I did end up in a district, same county, different district, actually the district that I work in now. Oh. <laughs> um, and let me say too, my my story is messy. Like I actually left this district five years ago in 2018. I left to pursue burn and teacher full time because I was doing Google training. So, so like I said, I'm trying to keep this short, but it's not simple. It's not easy and it's complicated. And I think that for a lot of people, it is complicated and they're embarrassed about it. And I I really I really started the podcast and started Burn In Teacher because I want people to know that it's okay that it's messy. It's okay that it's not sexy. Mm-hmm. It's okay that you're figuring things out as you go. Like we don't have all of the answers. But what I was really searching through all of these ups and downs and twists and turns and stop signs and, you know, uh, speed bumps is... I kept searching Google for a way for me to try to just figure myself out because what I learned from leaving education the first time and going into this um, executive director position is that I still carried all that baggage with me. I still carried all of those negative beliefs about myself and my own capabilities. I still carried that lack of self-awareness of how I was presenting myself to my, my staff and to my students 
I just had a complete and total lack of a lot of things. And I was just taking that, I was carrying that baggage with me to another place. Mm -hmm. So when I closed the nonprofit down and then started at a new district, new grade level, new school, new principal, new, you know, new um, teaching friends, I carried all of that with me. And I carried all of that nasty, negative self-talk and the memories that I had from this other school that I worked at with me here. And it finally, I really do believe, number one, that Burned In Teacher started in 2014 when I had that breakdown because that's when I really told myself, like, you've got to fix you. Mm. Like, and I know that it's, you know, in some spaces, it's not popular to say that that you need fixing, like we're not broken. But in that moment, I felt broken. And I felt like there were some things that I needed to fix in my life. And so to circle around, one time I was having a conversation in February 2016 with my husband. I was crying again again in our kitchen. He was like, what do you want? And I said, I don't want to live here anymore. And he went like ghostly white. Like he thought I was leaving him. And I was like, no, I want to live with you. I just don't want to live here anymore. (laughs) So they were all like, I'm talking about like from where I was living to where I was working to there were so many things. And can you imagine like how all of this, in addition to teaching a class full time, all of these things were just jumbled up in my head. And I really wanted a path out. Like I really wanted a way for me to help in a healthy way, work on myself. And work on my future, which works really well with your, you know, you want to talk about goals today. You're like, really think about like, what do I want? Do I really not want to be in the classroom? Do I really not want to teach? Because if I don't want to teach, then I need to figure out what my next step is. But I really do want to teach. But I've had s- such a horrible time off and on these last few years. Like, what can I do that's within my control in my classroom? And I couldn't find any answers. But I did dive into self-help and personal development, and that's where Burned In Teacher was really born because I put everything that I was learning into a path for myself. And I, I am very genuine and authentic when I say I come back to this process that I created every single day of my teaching career and my personal life. So that is really, I mean, there's no real super easy way to share with you my teaching story because it really was very messy. And like I said, I did leave twice. I left again in 2018, but not because of burnout. I left because I had become a Google trainer. That's really what ignited my fire for teaching again. I wanted those badges. I went to a Google conference. I wanted to be a Google trainer and I did it. And it reignited my my fire for teaching. And that's actually in 2016. In April 2016 is when we were coming home from this Google conference. I decided I want to become Google certified. I woke up from a nap because we stayed up way too late the night before and burned in teacher just was like right there. Like it's the opposite of burned out. And that's where I really started to build this pathway out of burnout for myself. And now it's what I help thousands of teachers around the world. It's what I help them do as well. Okay. Well, First of all, thank you for your authenticity. And I love hearing you ad- not admit that feels like it's a bad thing you shouldn't admit, but like just share how you have gone in and out and you've tried, you moved down the hall, you moved down the school, you moved down to the district and back again. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes we feel very stuck by where we are because it's where our kids go or it's the closest to our house or it's the only high school in my district or whatever. And yeah. sometimes, you know, it's worth taking a look at making some changes and, and maybe saying this isn't forever. Maybe I will come back here. I I have a very much like a, I have such like a permanent mindset. I'm not a fixed mindset working on it, but like where I'm just like, okay, you know, if I do this now, this is what it's going to look like the rest of my life. And it's like, that's literally not true at all. And I think that that's where so many, I mean, we've been taught, you know, since we were young that we need to, you know, go to college and pick this career and that's what you'll do the, for the rest of your life. And that's changed so much, especially in the last, you know, five years, especially since COVID, that we have learned that there is no permanency in anything. And there's right. certainly no guarantee of anything. And so one thing that we get to control, and I teach this to my kindergartners too, is that we get to choose what we think. Mm -hmm. We get to choose how we react. We get to choose what we do. We get to choose our actions. And that's really empowering because for someone that used to just kind of mope down the hallway and think like, this is it for me. Now I, you know, I'm back in the classroom because I quite literally missed it. I really, I 
I am an extrovert. I've learned I'm, I'm an introverted extra, or I'm sorry, an extroverted introvert. I don't know. My daughter and I were having this conversation. We don't know which one, but I do enjoy my time alone. And at first when I left in 2018, I thought it was really cool that I got to work from home. But after the first year and a half, I was like, it's really quiet. And then COVID hit. And then it got really like, I didn't, I wasn't traveling to schools anymore. And I was like, I told my husband one day, I was like, I missed the classroom. I might go back. And he was like, well, Lord knows we need you. So if we, <laughs> if you're ready to go back, let's, let's do it. And I was like, he goes, do you think you could still do burned in teacher and teaching full time? I said, yeah, you know, I think I can. And it's actually worked out really well. That's awesome. So how long have, when did you come back? 20, 21 or 22? 21, 22. Okay. Yeah. Last school year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you started the burned in teacher. So people might be thinking, okay, you said it's the opposite of burnout, but what else is, what does a burned in teacher really mean? Yeah. So, uh, so like I said, I want to make sure that I clear up any, <laughs> any false beliefs about what burned in means. It does not mean positive all the time. It doesn't mean you have everything figured out. It doesn't mean you're Pinterest worthy, Instagram worthy teacher. You know, I mean, you can see my background. Like <laughs> I, I, I don't have like, <laughs> there, there are a lot of things that I don't believe about being a burned in teacher and being perfect and having it all figured out is not one of them. So, uh, burned in really means that you are, your headspace and your your teacher brand is really reflective of you understanding that there's only so much that we have control over. And one of those things is our mindset. Another thing is what we can do, what our actions are. And we do get to choose what our next best step is. And that really comes from going through this entire process of burned in. So I'll just, I won't go into de depth. We definitely don't have time for that, but just to help you understand that burned in teacher really started out as a blog where I was just sharing my story and just really being honest about the challenges that I had had and what steps I was taking to move through those things rather than remain stuck in them because that's where I stayed for so long. And uh, so, and then it, I actually have the voice memo on my phone still where I was on my way to school in 2016. I was like, what if burned in could be an acronym? Like B is begin where you are. And then there's like things that you can do within that step. And then you was understand your teacher brand. And so I, I, I built it out into an entire program. Um, that's really the cornerstone of what um, hacking teacher burnout is my, my book. And then I do have a course and a community based around it. But what it what it stands for is B is begin where you are. So like figuring out like what brought me here. This is this is where I am. Okay. Here's what brought me to this place. You was understanding your teacher brand. So we really focus on building your self-awareness and really thinking about what legacy you're leaving. And both of this, both we're we're talking both personally and professionally here. We're not just talking as a teacher because we are human beings first, teacher second, or maybe even third. <laughs> okay. So then R is reflect on your challenges. So that's really where we wrap our minds around, you know, because there's so many things to be fr that are frustrating about being a teacher, really focusing on what it is we can and cannot control. And then N is nurture your strengths and habits. So this is really thinking about realizing what makes you, you, what makes you great. And then whether or not your habits are adding to or taking away from your greatness and your ability to grow through this burnout. E is extend your reach and possibilities. So this is about thinking, okay, what are my challenges? What am I doing about it? Okay, I can control this, but what do I need to learn? Who do I need to reach out to? Who who do I need to surround myself with? And what do I need to do more of just because it's fun? Mm -hmm. Because I don't have to wait until summer break to have fun mm -hmm. in my life. I don't have to wait until I retire in 25 years to <laughs> have fun in life. Like we aren't guaranteed any of those things. D is determine your long-term goals. So that's really about thinking like, where do I want to be in a year? How about three years? How about five? Like, do I see myself being in the classroom in five years? Yeah, personally, I do. But maybe that's not what you feel. So in five, you can't wait until five years to make the leap. Like we really need to be thinking these things out. Um, I is initiate lasting change. And that's because a goal without a plan is just a wish. So we really talk about, you know, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily actions, very small actions that have big ripple effects in your life. And then N is never settle. So that's really realizing that, you know, the burned in process is not linear. It, you're not going to, you're not going to stay at a burned in status by going through this program or reading this book and then putting it down and you're done. You're healed. You have no work to do. Like, it's a cyclical process. And that's why I say that I use it every single day when I'm faced with a challenge. I really do begin where I am. Like, okay, what's ticking me off about this? <laughs> what brought me here? How long have I been shoving these feelings down for a week or two? Mm -hmm. Has, is this just, am I just having a bad day? 
Um, rather than saying, oh my gosh, I'm doomed. I can't do this anymore. You know, that's where I used to go. And now it's like things that you, I used to make a mountain out of are now those mole pills because I used to be very dramatic about day to day in and out challenges. Oh, I can relate. My husband says I have doomsday energy, like mm -hmm. things become doomsday. So I understand. And I love, I love a good acronym. So I love that you <laughs> made that an acronym. Okay. So if you like for my listeners, obviously we're going to link your book and your course and your website, all of that for them so they can check it out if they're interested. But like for someone listening right now on their drive to work and they're like, I am burned out. <laughs> like yeah. what would be like one thing you could tell them right now that mm -hmm. would help today yeah. or this week? Yes. Um, so number one, saying it out loud is really a healthy thing to do because you fighting against it is only going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. But you embracing it, and meeting yourself where you are is the healthiest thing that you can do. And if you're burned out, that doesn't mean that this is the end for you in education unless you want it to be. Mm -hmm. There are – I mean, I am like the poster child for like burnout, right? Like I left teaching twice. I returned twice. Like <laughs> so I know that if you choose to leave now that you could come back. Lord knows we need all the teachers we can get right now. But I just want you to know you're not alone. You're not crazy. You're not a bad person. You're not a bad teacher. You are normal and you're having a hard time. Mm -hmm. And my next step would be to think about like, uh, for me, I have a free teacher burnout quiz. You can link that as well. And what that does is it helps you to realize like what's your burnout type. Okay. So are you burned and unbalanced, which means like you're just overwhelmed. You feel like you're working all the time. There's not enough time to do all of the things that you need to do. You're grading during practices. You're entering grades during, you know, you're sitting on the couch watching TV. You're grading, entering grades, planning. You feel behind all the time. Okay. If you're burned and over it, that's where you are somebody who like, you probably have pretty, pretty good systems. You're not feeling like you're working all the time. But your team or your administration or the work culture is just sucking the life out of you. It's so negative. Your students are apathetic. Your administrator you feel doesn't support you. Um, maybe you've asked for help and you're not getting it. Maybe your team doesn't collaborate well. Like you're just surrounded by that negativity and apathy that's burned and over it. Burned and bored is where you feel like you've got it going on. Like like that. that's where I feel like I was in 20, 2012, 2013. I had things like rolling pretty good. Like I didn't spend all hours of the day or evenings uh, planning, prepping, grading. Like I left school at a decent time. I had great friendships at my um, in my grade level. But I was I just felt like there was something else that I should be doing or that I could be doing. I was burned and bored. I was comfortable, mm -hmm. and instead of being content, I had. And I'm a very driven person. But I've also learned to be content. There was not that contentment there. It was, I was just not content. I felt like I wanted to do something else, but I had no idea what that was. Mm -hmm. And this could be anything. This could be you wanting to move to a different school. This could be wanting you wanting to, you know, maybe get your master's in counseling or administration, or, you know, maybe it's a change that you want to go somewhere else in education, and maybe it's you want to leave education altogether, but you're either telling yourself you can't or you're scared and you won't do it or you um or you feel like it's too hard or you like I, like I was you just don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the three burnout types that I help coach teachers through and you could also be burnt not burned out but something is off where you know things are great like you're not burned you don't you're not feeling like you dread going to school every day but you're like I'm just starting to feel a little different in these last couple months than I felt you know, at the beginning of the school year, or I didn't feel like this way at all last year or the year before, but now I'm kind of like, ick, you know, like what's going on? So there are four different types that you could be burned and unbalanced, burned and over it and burned and bored or not burned out, but something is off. Mm -hmm. So that's really a place where you can be like, okay, we're going a little deeper. Like I'm not just burned out, but this is, this is my type. Because we can't, where I got really stuck when I was searching for burnout solutions is that it was drink more water, go for a walk, meditate, get more sleep. <laughs> like those are all really great self-care and healthy options to just take care of yourself in general. But none of that was going to help me with my negative self-talk. None of that was going to help me to stop venting over wine with my friends. Like none of that was productive <laughs> for me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I felt like I was stuck. And that's where I really started to do the research and started to really work on myself specifically. specifically. And that's why I say, you know, the burn in process is really your personalized burnout plan. I love that. That is so helpful. Okay. So 
any other advice you would have that would be really practical and applicable right now for the teacher who is like, how am I going to make it to the end of the school year type thing? Mm. Because it sounds like this is a process. Like you said, you're going to have to like really dive into it and it's going to be a long-term thing. But what about the teacher who's like, I don't know if I'm going to make it to the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So what I would say to any teacher who's feeling right now, like they can't make it to the end of the year, you're looking way too far ahead. You know, I, I my and I can speak from its experience because I my number one strength is futuristic. I am always looking far ahead, right? Like I am always moving the goalpost. I am always thinking about what is next, what is next. Okay, this is done. What is okay? This isn't even done, but what's next? <laughs> so I I totally understand that. And I used to do the same thing. I remember on the first day of school for years in a row, thinking, "Oh my God, I have 180 days left of this." And that's day one. Like I think about that, and I'm just like, "Oh, that's such, that's such a miserable, miserable place to live," because I was not embracing the day to day. And I know, you know, I, I and I used to roll my eyes about this too. But when you're not living intentionally and working intentionally, you are looking 180 days because you really aren't seeing the point to your day-to-day work and the impact that you're making day-to-day. And that can be really dangerous for many reasons. It can be, it's dangerous to your mental health. It's dangerous to the students that you're working with every day. And I, and I don't see dangerous in like a physical form, but it just has a ripple effect that just destroys your inner being, right? Like if I'm not continually thinking about what I'm going to do today and having something to look forward to today or having something to look forward to this weekend, I will go to that place. I know myself really, really well. So what I would say to anybody who is really struggling with, I don't know if I can make it to the end of the year, I guess my question would be why? Why can't, why do you feel like that? Well, my students are out of control. Okay. Why are they out of control? Well, they're, you know, they're throwing things in my classroom. They're calling me names. I have kids throwing chairs. Okay. Why is that happening? All right. So this, and let me tell you, there's not like one easy answer to this. Okay. It could be that you've talked to administration and you don't feel like you're getting any help. So if that's the case, what is your next step then? If you feel like your kids are in danger, and I and I bring up behavior because it is such a huge factor these days. Mm-hmm. I've had it happen in my classroom. I talk to teachers all the time about this happening. So if your school is not, if you don't feel supported and safe and your students don't feel supported and safe, what is your next step there? Who else do you need to talk to? Has somebody else out there found a solution that you've just not found yet? Right. Like, and I can't, I'm not just going to throw out there, build relationships with them because, you know, that is, that's so relative and so subjective. But who can you ask for help? Because you can ask for help from more than your administration. Okay. And if you move your way down the line and ask enough questions to enough people and ask for help from enough people, I guarantee you someone's going to give you at least a sliver of suggestion that is going to help you to do something a little bit different. Or maybe they'll know somebody who can actually come in and help you in a different way. Mm -hmm. And that, again, I don't know people's realities out there. I'm not pretending to pass judgment. I'm not saying this is easy, right? Like easy and simple. The burned in process is simple, but it's not easy because it really does encompass an entire mindset shift around what you are in control of and what it is that you can do next if things are really hard. If it's your workload and you're saying, well, I'm working all hours of the day. Okay, why? Well, I have tons of grading to do. Okay, why do you have tons of grading to do? Well, I, you know, I have these assignments, I have homework, I have all of these things that I have to grade every single day. Okay, so what is a way that we can simplify that for you? What is a way, what do you need to eliminate? What do you need to adopt? What do you need to abandon? What do you need to adjust to make things easier on you? Because I'm going to tell you right here, no one's going to come here and empty your plate for you. Mm-hmm. So, and if you've ever wondered what the definition of quiet quitting is, quiet quitting is not quietly walking out the door and never returning to your job. <laughs> like that's that's not what it is. Quiet quitting has become a really popular term. And really what it means is what I've been talking about for years, which is if no one else is going to take things off of your plate, you have to take things off of your plate for yourself. And maybe some people might think that's being insubordinate, but I don't believe that it is because we 
we are human beings. We are being paid for certain contract hours. And if we are being given too much to do within those contract hours, we have to decide what we're going to leave behind. And chances are no one's going to notice a lot of those things. You you are like speaking my love language or like the refrain of my life on this podcast. I feel like it's so true. You're yeah, there's so I always ask, like, like you said, not in an insubordinate way, but like how required is required. Like, yeah. are they saying required, but it's really just a suggestion or are they saying right. required and they're going to follow up and like, it's going to be a part of your job eval and you may lose your job type thing. Cause you're right. If you've sought other solutions and you're not getting help from other places and other avenues, you eventually have to help yourself. And that's right. by taking things off your plate. Exactly. Exactly. And what I always suggest is too, is er, first of all, another thing I want to say about quiet quitting is it really is you deciding what is best for you and your students. It's not you walking out in the class out of your classroom and saying, I'm done and like being negative and nasty to people and like being loud about it. It's called quiet quitting because you're quietly backing away from things that you know are not best for your students. You're quietly quitting things that you know are not best for you and your mental health. You are quietly quitting some of the thoughts that you have been believing for so long. You're quietly quitting some of the negative conversations that you're having in the teacher's lounge. And instead, you're going to your classroom to get your work done and, you know, to clear off your desk, you know, whatever it is that you need to do so that you can truly take care of you and take care of the kids that you were there to serve. I love that. Yeah, because at the end of the day, it comes down to the kids and it does come down to those relationships. Like you said at the beginning, like, that's why we're staying, you know, at the end of the day, if you're like done with the kids, then yeah. it maybe is your time to kind of consider it might other options, but it might be, but I do have to say something about that too. Last year when I started teaching kindergarten, you know, this is post pandemic. We know that post pandemic s- students, especially kids coming into kindergarten and elementary school, they are very, they are so different, Rebecca, than the students that I had in 2007. I taught first grade. I never would have dreamed that I would have chairs thrown in my class. I never would have believed that I would be hit by a student. And that has all happened in the last two years, especially this year. And these are kids that were born in 2017. Like they were brought up in this, you know, they they are re- they're remembering some things about what has happened in the last few years. And the parenting styles have changed so much. And And here's the difference between Amber today and Amber 14 years ago, is I would have spent my time having these nasty negative conversations about these students, how they're so disrespectful, and these parents, and about how awful they are. And both of those things might be true. However, those conversations are not serving me. And it's causing me to not be reflective on what I could possibly do differently. And last year, when I first started teaching kindergarten, and I had some kids in my class, like, I have, I am very structured. I have wonderful classroom management. It took me years to kind of hone in and work out, you know, and I learned from a lot of people. I'm very structured, have very, very good classroom management, but these kids were even testing all of the knowledge that I had. And I went and I enrolled myself into some classroom management classes and courses. And I learned and I implemented the next day. There's no time to waste when it comes to making changes in your life. Mm. There's no no time to waste because it was making me miserable. I And not hysterically, but I was so frustrated one day. I went to my principal and assistant principal. I asked for a meeting. I said, I have never in my in my then 13 years, I've never known what to not, like I've never not known what to do. Mm. I've never not known how to react. And I don't know what to do. And so they gave me a lot of suggestions and I tried them and, and some of them worked. But I didn't stop there. I went online and I went to Instagram and I searched classroom management and I searched, you know, kids throwing chairs, kids yelling, disrespectful students. Like I looked up all of this stuff and I found wonderful answers that I then got to try. I I called it a practice year then for the rest of the year. And it made huge differences, but it made compounding differences this year. And I'm even learning more this year that I'm applying to my students this year that I will apply next year because I know that because things are just because things are hard now doesn't mean they're going to be hard every day and it doesn't mean they're going to be hard next year. And that's what I used to tell myself. And I think that that, especially that, that teacher that's saying, I don't know if I can make it through the end of the year, you are believing to your core that every day is going to suck the way that it sucks right now. And that does not have to be your reality. 
It's so true. It all it is like such a shift in perspective, and I feel like seeing, you know, that j- you can change, but your students can change too. They can, and 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 giving them that opportunity and the tools to help them do that, just like you need the tools and opportunity to help yourself too. Right. Well, it's really interesting because a lot of the things that I talk about on here, I talk about with my students, of course, in a much simpler right. way. But I tell them, you know, guys, things are going to happen to you to make you so mad, but we ha- we still have to be kind. It's okay to need a break. It's okay for you to ask to go to the office because you need a minute. It's totally okay to do that. So, and I wouldn't have known that had I not done the research that I've done. And I have to say, I'm really lucky. I work in a school that's really valuing social emotional learning. Um, We definitely need that in the school that I work in. And all of this stuff is coming full circle. And I see the differences in my students, you know, from day one, even to day 20. And of course, now we were, I think we just did day 76. And they are, they are reflective of the work that I have done, not just to learn about classroom management, but of the work that I've done on myself. And when we're going through burnout, there are two things that can change. You can change one or you can change both. One of the things has to be you. I am not saying you're the problem, but I am saying we can easily add to the problem with our reactions, with our negative beliefs, and with the people that we we hang out with and what we do or do not do in order to move through and move on. And what I did in 2014 is I didn't change me. I changed my environment and I carried all of that baggage with me. And that's why I really strongly believe that if you really are truly dealing with burnout that is like debilitating and (laughs) you do not know if you can do this for the rest of the school year, do the work on yourself first. Because I can tell you, teacher or not, building your self-awareness learning about what you're capable of, learning about, you know, those mindset shifts that don't just change your perspective and your outlook of what your career in education could look like, but also your outlook in life. Like I never would have thought in 2016 that we would actually sell our house and move. But when I said that to my husband, when I said, I don't want to live here anymore, we made it, we sold our house in three days <laughs> on wow. Facebook, by the way. Like, oh my goodness. And that was extremely scary. And change is scary and change is hard. But we still, to this day, we moved about 45 minutes southeast of where we lived. And we left our hometown. We left all of our friends. We still, to this day, talk about what a huge transition that was for our family because it was the best move and it was the scariest thing we had ever done, besides having a baby at 18. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I love that. I I just have really appreciated all of your tips that are really action driven. Like I, Mm -hmm. that's one of the things I wanted when I started this podcast was, you know, I don't want to like just throw out a bunch of theories or ideas. I want it to be really specific and incredibly actionable. So the teachers listening can walk away and be like, okay, like what you're saying, if I'm feeling burned out, identify the why and really lean, like drill down into that to get to the nitty gritty details of it and then move on to the next steps of like, okay. You have to change yourself and you can also change your environment, but you still have to change yourself first. Yeah. Well, and the reality is, is having, being able to choose to leave. Do you know what a huge privilege that is? Yes. Yes. There are teachers out there that can't just quit. Right. There are, there are teachers out there who their husband or wife is self-employed and as the teacher, they're carrying the family insurance. Yeah. There are teachers out there that live in, live in such rural communities there is no other option for them or between they're on, farming, you know, besides farming or working at the local gas station. Like I've spoken at some of these schools, they are they are isolated. So the, the fact is that if you have a choice to leave, thank your lucky stars that you have that luxury because it is not a luxury for everybody around the world. And that's another reason that I believe so strongly in empowering teachers to really believe that they they can take steps to become happier and more fulfilled. But it really does begin with you because we can't all just pick up and leave. Right. It's, it's not an option for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't even think too, like those teachers whose spouse is on an army base and it's like, yeah. we are, we are dictated by their job and I have to go where their job goes and yeah. period, you know? Yeah. yeah. There's so many factors that play into it. Well, this has been incredibly enlightening. I'm so grateful. 
I have one more question for you. And then um, you can tell us how our listeners can connect with you. But I always like to ask all my guests, what's one way that you have simplified your life recently? Mm. Uh, So my husband and I are, uh, we're notorious pitchers. (laughs) So we, we do not keep things around that we don't need. And one thing that we have done to simplify our life lately is we uh, we just went through our pantry and our two closets in our um, in our downstairs area, and we rearrange rearranged some things because there was you know I always love there to be a flow like it makes sense for things to be over here because it's closest mm-hmm. to this area, and I'm a, I'm huge in organization, and so anytime we can organize something and get rid of things and that simplification is, is my life. I love it. So a good pantry organization. I love that. I love I do it every January. It's like one yeah. of my favorite things to do is just do a little reset on the pantry, you know, and even more specifically, um, I don't know, this is probably a month ago, all of a sudden I was looking for a certain spice and it felt just a little hard. Um, when I pulled it out of the pantry, it had expired in 2016. And I was like, Oh, <gasps> This is not allowed in my house. I cannot have expired. So I went through all of my spices and through all I had I had at least 20 spices that had expired like three years ago. So there's another well, that's even in more in depth. <laughs> I always find the most disturbing when you find a, a spice that is expired and you have moved it to multiple homes you've lived in. Yes. Since it's expired. I literally and you're did like, that. Yes. <laughs> I have been packing this in a moving truck and it has been expired for years. <laughs> like, what is this? I know I have I an it. alpha alphabetized spice rack now. And my husband like gives me like he is not an organization like I am. And he's like, you're yeah. ridiculous. But I'm like, <laughs> we have no expired spices. It's amazing. Yes. <laughs> I love it. You know, well, and that's kind of, you know, clearing out that clutter. And I say this a lot too, you know, clearing out that physical clutter, that that is so good for your mental health because a cluttered space reflects a cluttered mind. And I just, I refuse to be surrounded in clutter. And my teaching partner, Tracy, she always teases me because I am just constantly just pitching things. And she's like, I can't believe you're getting rid of that. I'm like, I haven't used it in the year and a half I've been here. I'm not going to use it. So it's gone. I don't have room. I, I, I'm not going to hold space for this. <laughs> yep. I have an entire, like my entire freebie on my website is a classroom reset challenge. Because mm-hmm. I think especially for science teachers, we can become such hoarders of models and student work samples and specimens. And it's like, yeah. okay, how long has this been in that corner cabinet in your classroom? Uh-huh. Buying space and you have not used it. None of your coworkers have come in and borrowed it. Like, what are we doing here? You yeah. know? Well, Get thank you so much. I know my listeners are going to want to connect with you and I'm going to link all your things, but for them listening right now, what's like the one place you're like, if you want to connect with me, go here. Oh, definitely go to Instagram. Okay. I'm at burned in teacher there. I'm at burned in teacher on all social media. That's where I hang out the most. I'll jump into stories and, you know, talk from my classroom or share things here and there. So yeah, definitely DM me, say hi on Instagram. I'd love to hear from you. Great. Thank you so much, Amber. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for having me. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode and my conversation with Amber. As always, you can connect with her and find any and all links mentioned in the show notes, which can be found at itsnotrocketscienceclassroom.com slash episode 59. And if you listen to this and really resonated with her description of being burned out and overwhelmed, then you might want to consider joining the waitlist for the Secondary Science Simplified Virtual Professional Development course. I am not a teacher burnout coach. I do not have the expertise that Amber has, but I do feel like I have a lot of wisdom and advice to share specifically for secondary science teachers, and that is why I wrote this course. The course came before the podcast, and again, it was written specifically to fill a need that I saw that there wasn't really specific, actionable professional development available virtually written for secondary science teachers who felt incredibly overwhelmed with all aspects of their job and were feeling very burned out and needed a way to simplify how how they did their jobs. So I wrote this to help you really think through the relationships you build with parents, admin, and students, how you lesson plan, how you manage your class, how you prepare and execute labs, how you assess your students, and ultimately how you find work-life balance. And so if you realize that when you're thinking through your burnout and the why might just be a lot of overwhelm and just not knowing how to do this job in the most 
simplified way, then I encourage you just to join the waitlist. You can join at it's not rocket science classroom.com slash waitlist. And then you'll be notified as soon as the course is open and available again to join, which will most likely be this summer. And again, it's not, there's no pressure whatsoever, but the waitlist is going to be who will be the first to know when things are open, how to get, you know, a PO to cover your expenses so your school can pay for your professional development, all of that. So if you are feeling burned out and overwhelmed specifically about being a secondary science teacher, I would love to serve you in that area. And I can do that if you join that wait list. All right, teacher friends, that wraps up today's episode. If you're looking for an easy way to start simplifying your life as a secondary science teacher, head to it's not rocket science classroom.com slash challenge to grab your classroom reset challenge. And guess what? It's totally free. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'll see you here next week. Until then, I'll be rooting for you, teacher friend.